So, folks, what just came out of the camp of Rudy Giuliani is devastating to Trump. We've known that for a few weeks now, he's had meetings with the higher ups at the Fed, at the DOJ. And while we don't 100% know if he formally flipped, we do know that he hasn't been punished yet. And coincidentally, he didn't get punished after these high level, very intense hour long meetings. And yet another sign has just dropped that Rudy and his people are flipping on Donald Trump. Hit the like and subscribe button as we track this historic day. This is going to be one of the most important days in the path between now and Donald Trump in an orange jumpsuit. And it has everything to do with Rudy, one of his pals, Bernie Carrick, and critically, the discussions around the quote unquote war room. If you remember after the election and before, you know, Joe Biden became president, Donald Trump had his lawyers and people like Bernie Carrick set up a war room very close to the White House at the Willard Hotel. And it was there, frankly, that a lot of the illegalities went down, that a lot of the criminal planning for Donald Trump to subvert the will of the American people, of millions of people just like you, went down. So what I have here is breakdowns of the importance of that war room. And then wait for it. You got to wait for it. Don't click away or Rudy Trump and Bernie Carrick, they all win if you click away. What I have is them surrendering, Rudy surrendering new files to Jack Smith that Donald Trump never wanted to see the light of day. Coming right from the broad Rudy camp, Trump is screwed. And NBC News has learned the prosecutors questioned him about Trump's state of mind during and after that whole election period. I mean, how closely did you work with William Russell and how significant do you think his perspective could be? I think that his um, perspective could be really uh, helpful to the special counsel's investigation. He was someone that I definitely crossed paths with. He was one of the trip directors in the advanced department. And so he was on the road um, with President Trump. Uh, Anytime that he was traveling, he would be aboard Air Force One with him um, and kind of acted as a body man for him at events and would be backstage with him. So this is someone who definitely had very close proximity to the president, who the president would know by name. And um, obviously he followed him uh, to Mar-a-Lago and after Trump left the White House. And so their relationship is still close, given that he is on the campaign. Um, I am curious, I don't know if this has been reported, if Will Russell's uh, lawyer is being funded by the Trump organization. So I think that that's something that will be key um, with, you know, determining his credibility with his testimony. But if he has good lawyers, and I, I would assume that they assured him to be honest and truthful and transparent in his testimony before the grand jury. But Sarah, given uh, that, that you saw him work closely with the former president, do you think that William Russell would have specific information about his boss's frame of mind around that time? I guess particularly if publicly he was citing fraud and decreeing fraud, but privately was conceding that he lost the election. I think it's certainly something that he could have been privy to. Like I said, this would have been someone that Donald Trump knew and traveled with often. And so I think he would have had access to those kinds of conversations where things of that nature would have been discussed. Sir, I want to play something former January 6th committee lead investigator Tim Hafey said yesterday on this program about the particular Rolling Stone article you see on your screen. Let's listen. It could be a link between the president and others in the White House and the rioters. That's the significance of the Willard and the War Room. Um, And I can't say that we found such a connection. The War Room is where, as you said, Steve Bannon and Rudy Giuliani and John Eastman, Bernie Carrick, I think Mike Flynn, there were a number of people there working on their sort of uh, investigation into these bogus theories of election fraud and the strategy for January 6th. Roger Stone was there and he had security, as did Mike Flynn, from the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys. And, and there was always an assumption that that he and that Bannon, that others were were sort of the connection between the White House and those extremist groups. We didn't get that kind of cooperation and could not establish that link. But that is precisely why the special counsel, I think, is interested in the activity at the war room. Sarah, do you know of anyone inside the White House on and around January 6th with any connection or communication to this so-called war room at the Willard Hotel? 
that wasn't something that um, I was involved with or uh, anyone on our team, uh, to my knowledge. But I think that that will be something crucial that uh, the special counsel is looking into, given that it seems that there may or may not have been communication with those kinds of far right extremist groups. Do you think that there might not be a connection that you know of because there really wasn't a line of communication between the war room and to Trump? Or do you think that that the players, if they had that communication, did so very carefully? I think that, um, you know, I definitely wouldn't have had access or would have been privy to that kind of planning or um, conversations of anything of that sort. Uh, given my role being in the press team. But I think that it's possible that they definitely did communicate with those folks and knew that they needed to do so very carefully and try to keep it hidden. You know, Sarah, your your testimony in front of the January 6th uh, Select Committee was powerful uh, in which you, you talk about his multiple opportunities to quell some of the violence we saw that day. But instead, a lot of the tweeting was was very sympathetic to the people who are breaking into the Capitol and committing that violence. As someone who was with the former president on January 6th, what are your thoughts on potential charges in connection with the events that led to that riot? Do you think that, given what we know from the select committee, do you think that the special counsel eventually will be able to unearth enough evidence to charge the former president? I think so. I don't want to get into specifics of what I think those charges will look like. I'll leave that to the legal experts. And obviously, we need to see what the potential indictment does even look like and what additional evidence that the um, special counsel uncovered that may uh, the that maybe the uh, House committee did not uncover. And so obviously, I think that the House committee laid out a lot of evidence, though, um, making the case for some charges. I think it's very clear that uh, Donald Trump was told multiple multiple times from the campaign, from his White House staff, that he lost the election, that there was no evidence of substantial fraud. And he continued to push that lie and tried to overturn in a very coordinated effort, tried to overturn the results of the election. And so I think that there will um, most likely be some of those charges that the House committee recommended. Sarah. New revelations on the so-called war room and key witnesses in Jack Smith's January 6th investigation. Here's a former White House insider just moments ago. Do you know of anyone inside the White House on and around January 6th with any connection or communication to this so-called war room at the Willard Hotel? That wasn't something that um, I was involved with or uh, anyone on our team, uh, to my knowledge, but... I think that that will be something crucial that uh, the special counsel is looking into, given that it seems that there may or may not have been communication with those kinds of far right extremist groups. I think that it's possible that they definitely did communicate with those folks and knew that they needed to do so very carefully and try to keep it hidden. Joining me right now, Lisa Rubin, MSNBC legal analyst and Hannah Moldavin, former spokesperson for the January 6th committee. So, Hannah, why do you think Jack Smith is focusing in part on any connection between Trump and that pre-January 6th war room. This is something the select committee was very interested in. This command center, if you will, of folks that were really close with Donald Trump outside of the White House, as you just heard from, from Sarah Matthews. No one inside of the White House uh, had connection to that that we, could, that we could talk to. But the individuals that we think of in this command center are ones that really said, I don't want to talk to the select committee. And a big reason is because of the implications of guilt for themselves, right? So we're thinking of Rudy Giuliani and his legal team. John Eastman, who is a part of that, was the legal mastermind behind the fake elector strategy. You have Steve Bannon, you have Roger Stone. John Eastman, who I just mentioned, came in to talk to the select committee and pled the fifth over 100 times. Roger Stone came in to talk to the select committee for about 90 minutes. He pled the fifth the entire time. These are individuals that we wanted information from, but, but couldn't get it. And, and one, one thing there about the extremist groups and the connection between the two, Roger Stone, who many folks are, are familiar with, had a very close connection with one of the groups um, that was charged with seditious conspiracy, individuals that were charged, uh, including Joshua James, who pled guilty to seditious conspiracy, 
who was Roger Stone's bodyguard on the day of January 6th, right? So this is a big point of, of connection. If you can connect Donald Trump and the White House to folks in, in the Willard and this command center that the select committee wasn't able to hear from. But if Jack Smith can get information about, that will be very valuable and important in his investigation. Lisa, before we ask you about Mark Meadows, is there anything that you want to respond to in terms of the legal implications of this war room and any connection with the White House? Well, actually, Lindsay, the thing I wanted to talk about was Mark Meadows and his connection to this room. We know that on July 5th and that evening, President Trump asked Mark Meadows to make calls to Roger Stone and Steve Bannon, who, as Hannah just explained, were integral characters in that war room at the Willard Hotel. In fact, according to Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony before the committee, he actually wanted to go down there and she talked him out of it. We know that he likely made contact with them that evening by phone. We obviously don't know the contents of that conversation because Mr. Meadows, among others, are people who didn't even bother to show up before the committee. And despite the fact that the committee referred him to the Department of Justice for contempt of Congress, was never prosecuted for that. Lisa, given what we know about Meadows, do you think that he right now potentially could have some legal implications and liability here? Or do you get a sense from what we know and frankly what we don't know that he could be cooperating? Well, Lindsay, those two things are not mutually exclusive, right? Okay. A person can be cooperating and they can also have criminal exposure and or have pled guilty already in what's called a sealed information. It's quite possible, given Mark Meadows' relative silence over the last few months, that Mark Meadows is both cooperating with the special counsel's office and as a condition of that cooperation, he was forced to acknowledge all of his criminal acts and plead guilty to at least some of them. We obviously don't know that yet, but I share the views of George Conway and others that Mr. Meadows' silence, particularly given his closeness to the president and the president's inner circle in the days after he left the White House, is at least suspicious, if not telling. Hmm. Well, one of the looming questions um, is still the possibility of, of what this could lead to. I mean, if there are convictions, even possible jail time. Here's the former president's reaction to that notion. That, for example, they do say Jack Smith says, OK, I'm going to put Donald Trump in jail. I think it's a very dangerous thing to mm -hmm. even talk about okay. uh, because we do have a tremendously a passionate group of voters. I think uh, it would be very dangerous. You know, Hannah, earlier in this hour, Sarah Matthews was particularly concerned about that comment. How do you interpret it? We have. Wait for it. So you can see this war room was essential, but it's not just what was happening in that room. It was the documentation produced and Rudy Giuliani didn't work alone. Like, obviously, he worked with Trump, but even separate from Trump, he had, like, a team of people. And one of those teams of people was a disgraced former police officer, Bernie Carrick. Now, Bernie Carrick had possession of untold amounts of pieces of paper that came from Rudy Giuliani and Trump. And at first, he and Rudy and others were arguing that he couldn't give these documents back to the DOJ, over to the DOJ, because it would have violate attorney client privilege. Because it was Rudy's documents and Trump's documents, and this guy was sort of working as an assistant to Rudy, but he just surrendered the documents on the advice of his lawyer, who used to be one of Trump's lawyers. And critically, guys, and this is where the Rudy announcement comes in, Rudy has not objected. Like, if Rudy was going to make the argument, I'm going to read you some reporting, that these indeed are my attorney documents with Trump and one of my assistants happened to have them, then he could make the argument that he, he might reject privilege, but I don't. They're my lawyerly documents. But he didn't. And this is brutal for Trump. It says here, former NYPD commissioner Bernie Carrick has struck a deal with the special counsel's office to turn over records in uh, connection with the investigation over Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election. It says that Carrick worked for the president collecting evidence of alleged election fraud that have been deemed without merit. And it says that Carrick's agreement to turn over the documents to the Department of Justice ends a dispute in which he was arguing that he was initially declining to cooperate with investigators who sought the documents. His legal team had argued that the request was a violation of attorney-client privilege, noting that Carrick was working for Rudy Giuliani, the former New York City mayor who served as Trump's lawyer. Carrick attorney Tenemy 
Sharifi Parlatori, who, if you remember, was recently Trump's lawyer, on Friday agreed to waive the privilege. Kerrick is expected to turn over approximately 2,000 pages of material documenting his efforts to find evidence in support of its investigation of Trump's involvement in election fraud. And it notes that the Daily Beast says the records could prove pivotal for f federal prosecutors who are seeking evidence of Trump's decision making process as he relentlessly voiced baseless accusations that the 2020 election was quote unquote rigged, even though he was told otherwise. And so these documents are going to be Carrick's documents, but they're also Rudy's broader, you know, institutional documents under the Rudy branch of the Trump sick tree. And Rudy isn't rejecting this. Rudy isn't fighting this. The documents are going over So This is Carrick and Rudy screwing Trump. Rudy made this big announcement today through his silence, and it is deafening. 